and for any of you who I've not yet met in person, my name's James, I'm vicar over at Hukanui, and yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to be here again with you this evening. Psalm 106 begins in this way, praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice and constantly do what is right. And it's true, isn't it? Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? In many ways, even as we come and gather as God's people and as we sing his praises and attend to his word, in many ways we're kind of like toddlers uh, who are still just learning how to talk. And even our kind of loftiest thoughts of God are still so much, so inadequate and so much uh, below his true glory and beauty. But the wonder is that even our attempts to talk and worship are pleasing to the Lord and accepted by him. And as we do come, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. And God's greeting to all who love him this evening is grace to you and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, we're going to stand and sing together, and we're going to sing from number 201, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So we'll stand and sing together, and we'll remain standing following the song to confess our faith. confess our faith together using the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. So I will ask the question and we will respond together. So people of God, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Uh, Please have a seat. We now have the opportunity as part of our worship to the Lord to give of him from our offerings, which the deacons will now collect.
Pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your many blessings to us. And we thank you that we can return a small part of these blessings back to your work and your people here in this church. And we ask that you would continue to be with all those who are not with us, whether they be sick, elderly, or traveling. Continue to provide them with your care and sustaining hand. And we ask that you give the deacons wisdom regarding these funds and how they administer them. May they bless your work here in this congregation and the community around us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Ray is going to come forward and lead us in a time of congregational prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we know from your word that you hear our prayers. When we humble ourselves before you, so tonight we come together as a church body seeking forgiveness, seeking your healing. We know that whenever we draw near to you, to the throne of grace, we are together. Whether we are local or distant, we draw near to that same God, that everlasting God that we can trust in. So as a loving and gracious God, we thank you that we have been able to affirm who you are and all that you are to us in our songs and worship. That you are for us a true father, for even the best of us earthly fathers could never approximate to the absolute faithfulness, the precision and grace and care that you have shown for each one of us and that you have ordered and guided our steps not only in these past days of this last week, but also of the days of all our lives thus far. And tonight, as best as we know how, it's our earnest desire to praise you in song and worship, that we may love you from the bottom of our hearts, that we might have fellowship in the gospel with one another, even when sometimes we're apart. We also thank you for our nation, especially with these coming political elections that we have, to pray for those in positions of authority. We pray for the work of grace in the lives of many that we so often regard as unlikely recipients of your kindness. And we pray that you may work in order that the generations, that's our grandchildren, our grandsons, our daughters, that they may come to live in a realm of peace, one of happiness, of truth, of justice, of faith and godliness. We pray that in our day you would unlock the eyes of those whose minds are filled with futility, with emptiness, that you will break down every barrier for the gospel. And that as your truth is proclaimed, as people live out a testimony of your grace, that many will come to know you and love Christ, just as we do. We pray for the church throughout the world at this time. In many countries and continents, the church is under attack of the enemy like never before. 
crushed from every side, often beaten, jailed, tortured, disowned, murdered. Those that lead and are on mission especially need our prayers and support. So we ask that you would revive us and you would stir us up by way of the pure remembrance of your grace, that you would help us understand just how historic our faith really is. From the very beginning, you are a God which you called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, that you set your people free, that you raised up the judges, that you provided the people with kings to lead them. The prophets speak of your word, and finally, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ came and made himself known, and in his own body, on the tree of Calvary, bore our sins that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then we might ask, who then is sufficient to proclaim these things? Well, none of us, not one of us. We also acknowledge, again, our dependence on you. We thank you for the word of scripture. We thank you that James can bring this clarity tonight, whereby you remind us of your grace, that it's made perfect in our very weakness, so that when we are weak, then we may discover something of what it means to be strong. Thank you, Lord, when we remember those friends and family members that have been taken from us in Christ. They fall asleep into the arms of Jesus and waken up into a new home, a home in every way they could never have understood or imagined. So we rejoice that for them, being absent from the body, they are now present with you, the Lord. Grant then that knowing this comfort and security, we may share it in a very real and unsafe world that many may come to understand who Jesus is. Help us when we look out on the week ahead with the many issues and problems that we will face. Stir us up in such a way that we may continue to give generously to the gospel in time and money and that we may live selflessly to the praise of your glory. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, well, we're now going to stand and sing together. And we're going to sing some of the words of Psalm 119 from verses 41 to 48. So we'll stand and sing as we prepare to come to the word uh, that God would Come and work in us through his word. So we'll stand and sing together.
Uh, please have a seat. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. So Luke 8, and we will read the first 21 verses. Luke 8, and starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some woman who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, uh, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy uh, when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life, life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Somebody told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Right, so we're going to be thinking about these verses together. So it will be helpful if you keep your Bibles open as we'll be looking at a number of these verses in detail. Will you pray with me now? Lord God, we thank you for the seed of your word. We thank you that your word is powerful and effective. We thank you that the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. And yet, Father, even just reading these verses, we are made aware that uh, whenever your word goes out, uh, it is a weighty business, and Satan is often near at hand to snatch the word uh, before it could penetrate our hearts. So we pray that you would thwart his purposes this evening. Uh, we pray that by the ministry of your Holy Spirit, uh, the seed of your word would fall on fertile soil this evening. Uh, that it would bring forth a harvest, and Lord, that you would be glorified and honoured uh, through making us to be a people who not only hear your word, but do it. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. 
Uh, well, I wonder if you've ever thought about the question of why some people believe uh, and other people don't believe. Perhaps one of the most common and the most tragic examples uh, would be uh, that perhaps even of your own children. Maybe, some of, maybe that's true of some of you here this evening, uh, that you've got two children who were uh, raised in the same household, they were raised in the same way, they heard the same Bible stories, they went to the same Sunday school, perhaps attended the same catechism classes, uh, they heard the same sermons, and yet one believed in the Lord, and the other turned completely away. And I've got no doubt that for each and every one of us here this evening, are uh, the stories that you could tell of seeing this, maybe even seeing that here in this church. And particularly, uh, if you have experienced this firsthand, uh, that, then it can be incredibly discouraging to see uh, people, especially people that we care so deeply aw- about, are uh, turning away from the truth that they have received. So what, re- what keeps us going when we find ourselves in that place? Uh, why is it that some believe and some don't? How should we think about this question? And really that's part of the answer that this well-known parable is seeking to answer. So we're going to be thinking about it together and we're going to ask two basic questions. Uh, what does this parable mean? What's the point of it? And how does it apply? What's it supposed to mean for our lives? So firstly, in verses 1 through 15, uh, what does this parable mean? Well, if you look at verse 1, uh, it says that Jesus and the twelve and a number of the women uh, were traveling around proclaiming uh, in, uh, the kingdom of God. And as part of that proclamation, Jesus preaches this parable. And usually in the Gospels, uh, parables are often snapshots of the kingdom that hone in on a key aspect of either what the kingdom is like or what the king is like. Parables are kind of a little bit like those political cartoons that you sometimes see near the end of the newspaper. And when you look at the cartoon, it's rather humorous and people's features are kind of wildly exaggerated. And it's entertaining to look at, but the point isn't primarily entertainment. Instead, there is a message that the cartoon is conveying, that behind the humour, there's a point that the cartoonist is making about the society uh, that we live in, or things going on in society. And the parables are much the same. That usually there's a picture or an image which would have been very familiar to the people Jesus was speaking to, uh, but there's a point to the the picture. It's conveying a message. And for most of the parables, uh, it leaves it up to us, the readers, to figure out exactly what that point is. But for one or two of them, Jesus actually explains the point of the parable, and this parable is one of those which Jesus does that. So the picture of the parable before us is, of course, that of a farmer or a sower sowing the seed. And this was a very common practice at this time, and there were usually three stages. So firstly, the farmer would go and sow the seed on his plot of land, and no doubt a fair bit of it would be rocky or thorny. Then after some time, he would plough the ground uh, to make sure that as much of the seed made it into the soil as possible, And finally, after some point, he would go and reap the harvest. So if you look at the parable in front of us, from verse 5 onwards, uh, Jesus describes four different places that the seed falls. And he goes on to explain uh, that this is a picture of gospel ministry, or specifically of how different people hear and respond to Jesus and his ministry. So if you look with me at the first example, or the first place the seed falls in verse 5, the seed fell along the path and was trampled, and the birds of the air devoured it. And if you look down at verse 12, it explains it in this way. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And so it's this terrifying picture of Satan snatching the word 
before it could even gain entrance into a person's heart. And while it's jumping the gun in some senses, uh, you've seen this, haven't you? Uh, You've seen this when you've tried to share the gospel with somebody and there's just nothing, just stony-faced, and not the slightest traction on the person's face or heart, Uh, just nothing. And the reason is that the devil has come and snatched the word from it. Now the next category, if you look down, is the seed that fell on the rocky soil and began to grow, uh, but withered. So seed began to grow, uh, but the roots are shallow, and it doesn't last. And if you look at verse 13, it says that those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. So some growth, but no fruit, no harvest. These are those who are happy to follow Christ in the sunshine, but as soon as the clouds approach, they abandon him. And no doubt, even within Luke's gospel, perhaps this should bring to mind the crowds of people who flocked to hear Jesus, and they were so positive about him initially. But as soon as public opinion began to sway, they abandoned him because the price is too high. The third category is a seed sown among the thorns, where the thorns grew up and choked it. If you look with me at verse 14, it says, The seed that fell among the thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. And I suspect that for many of us here this evening, Uh, Perhaps even specific faces come to mind of people who seemed so promising, uh, who seemed to receive the word with joy and authenticity, but then were enticed away by the world and all that it offers. It's a little bit like the story of Demas. I don't know if you know the story of Demas. If you know your New Testament well, then you may well know that the name Demas comes up a number of times in it. And Demas was a fellow worker with the Apostle Paul. He would travel with Paul all over the Roman Empire, planting churches. He was a gospel worker. And the very last mention that we have of Demas in the Bible is at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul's last letters. And all that it says is, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Again, choked by the pleasures of this world. I remember when I was in Dunedin, there was a guy that I knew quite well who had uh, one of these amazing conversion stories. He was a medical student at the university. He had no church background. So one day he was swimming at the sea and he was uh, caught in a rip and pulled out to sea. And he was sure that he was going to drown. And he cried out in desperation to God, Uh, God, if you save me, I'll believe in you. And shortly after praying that prayer, uh, his hand hit a rock, and he climbed onto this rock and was saved, and uh, was saved from the waves. And soon after that, uh, he was one of these young Christians who were on fire for the Lord, uh, constantly sharing the gospel with all the people around him, going to a solid church, being discipled by mature Christians, and discipling other people. But as time passed, our priorities began to shift. They began to be less frequent at church. They started dating a non-Christian girl. And finally, he stopped even coming to church or professing to be a Christian, choked by the pleasures of this world. And the final place that the that the seed falls is on the good soil. So if you look with me at verse 15, it says, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word of God, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Now these are the seeds which not only are sown, 
but actually bring forth a harvest, are the authentic followers of Jesus who not only hear the word but do it, who not only start well but finish well. And as you read through these verses, I found, especially the first time that I read through it, it can almost feel like quite a discouraging picture now that of all the seeds being sown, perhaps one in four actually brings forth a harvest. But we have to understand that for uh, the audience that Luke was talking to and the practice of sowing, uh, this was actually fairly normal and somewhat expected. Uh, that the sower didn't expect every seed to bring forth a harvest, but simply that enough would grow to bring a sufficient harvest. And so it's important as we look at this parable in front of us, uh, that the primary point of it is actually to be as a lens to help us interpret Jesus' own ministry. That what Jesus describes in this parable is exactly what you see in Luke up to this point. Uh, that there's such a wide diversity of responses to Jesus. Uh, that some love him and trust him, uh, and others doubt him and reject him. And the point is uh, that in Jesus' ministry, God is sowing the seed uh, for the harvest which has been promised all through the Bible up to this point. And in Jesus' sowing of the seed, there is both indictment and encouragement. And the indictment is if you look at verse 10, uh, when the uh, disciples asked him about the meaning of the parable, uh, he said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. And that final phrase there is actually a quotation from Isaiah 6. And the point of it is that just as Isaiah was sent uh, to a people who wouldn't listen as a ministry of condemnation and of judgment, uh, so, Christ, so Jesus' ministry also is actually a ministry of judgment and condemnation for all who will not receive it. Perhaps one way to phrase it uh, would be to say that it would be better to never hear than to hear and not believe. It's pretty sobering, isn't it? But there's also encouragement here in these verses. And this is really the point of the parable. So if you take a look with me, when Jesus explains the parable in verse 9 downward, he's not actually talking to the wider crowd anymore, but he's specifically talking to his disciples. And if you flick across to chapter 9 of Luke, and you'll see that shortly after this, Jesus is actually going to send out the 12 disciples uh, to go and begin proclaiming the word for themselves. Uh, and that as they go out, uh, the disciples are going to learn firsthand that these mixed responses to Jesus' word are actually going to echo out in every other authentic ministry. And it's the same for us, isn't it? That as we seek to share the gospel in our parenting, as we seek to share the gospel in our Sunday school and other ministries we're part of, uh, with our wider family, with the people that the Lord has placed around us, uh, some will believe and some won't. Uh, some will start well, but then drift away, and others, to, to our joy, will persevere and bring forth a harvest. But the encouragement for us is the same as it was for the disciple. That even in the, mix, in the uh, midst of this mixed responses, actually the plan of God is unfolding and there is going to be a harvest. Now, the wise farmer doesn't expect every seed he sows to bring forth a harvest, but he sows generously and, liber and um, liberally, trusting that enough will. And actually, brothers and sisters, uh, that is our calling also. It's what the Lord calls us to, uh, to sow the gospel seed generously and liberally, not trusting that every person who hears it will believe, but actually trusting that some will, and that there will be a harvest. So I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about the first 15 verses of this parable itself, and some of the implications. 
And now we're going to think about those final verses from verses 16 through 21 about how the parable applies. So how does a parable relate to these seemingly unconnected verses? Well, it's quite interesting if you look at them that in both of these following sections, the focus continues to be on the hearing of the word of God. So if you look down at verse 18, it says, Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Or again in verse 21, it says, My mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. That these passages, that these passages are fleshing out the implications uh, of this parable. So if you look at verse 16, it says, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. So it's a little bit like if you light a torch, or I guess nowadays we're more likely to uh, turn on the old smartphone to get the light going, Uh, but nobody uh, turns on your smartphone or your torch and then instantly puts a blanket over it or instantly uh, puts it under a jar because to do so would be to completely defeat the purpose of giving light. And the point seems to be that in the same way that the light of the lamp is seen and revealed, so also is what kind of soil we are. That what kind of hearers we are, which category of the parable we might fit into, will be seen in your life and your actions. Nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest. And really this is driving to what is probably one of the most central and the most challenging questions of this passage, which is quite simply, uh, which kind of hearer are you? Where has the seed fallen in your life? Uh, Jesus spoke this parable to the crowds, and so the seed had been sown, And the question was, what kind of response would it bring forth? And really that's the point of this entire uh, sowing imagery. Uh, Has there been a harvest? Hopefully you can't read through these verses uh, without actually asking that question. Where has the seed landed in your life? Has it been snatched away before it could even reach the soil? Uh, Has it been superficial growth without roots? Uh, Even now this evening, is growth being threatened to be choked out by the the lies and the pleasures of this world? Or actually, has that seed been uh, planted in rich and fertile soil, uh, sending down fruits and beginning to, to roots and beginning to show forth a harvest? And it can be quite a hard question to ask of ourselves, uh, to accurately uh, diagnose or decipher our own hearts and actions. In some ways, it's a little bit like the process of growing up, especially I found when I was young, uh, that you never actually feel like you're growing up. And the reason for that is that the change often happens in such small ways uh, day after day. And the people who are older than you always feel so much more grown up and more mature and so much taller than you. But then when you find that you reach that age, you find that actually you're still just you. (laughs) And you're not quite as different as you hoped you, you might be. And often it's only as you look back that you can see, uh, actually, I'm a little bit taller than perhaps I was last year. And in many ways, it can be like that as Christians, uh, that when we look at our lives, uh, we often don't feel like we're growing. We often don't feel like we're in the place that we hoped we might be. And sometimes, perhaps the reason for that is that the growth is happening in small steps, uh, day after day. And maybe for us as well, it's only as we look back that we can say, hey, you know what? Actually, I'm a little bit taller. Actually, I'm a little bit more like Christ. Actually, I'm a little bit more aware of my sin 
uh, than I was last year or than I was five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, One question that can be helpful, although challenging, in working through this uh, goes like this. Uh, When was the last time that you repented of something or made a change in your life as a direct result of the preaching or the reading of the Bible. I'll say that again, it's a bit of a mouthful. When was the last time that you repented of something or made a, a practical change in your life based on something that has come from the Word of God, either the preaching of the Word or the reading of the Word? And it's quite a challenging question if you try and think about that and think about it not simply generally, but actually think about it specifically. Uh, is the Bible doing something in your life? And if we can't answer that question, uh, then we have to at least ask ourselves, are we holding fast the word uh, with a noble and a true heart? Take care how you listen. Well, I wonder as we read through these verses, uh, if you noticed the grace in these verses. So at least one question that comes to mind as you read through this passage is what makes one place where the seed falls uh, different from another place? Uh, Why is it that one person hears and believes and another person hears and rejects? Or perhaps even in your own life, the question might be, uh, why did that one sermon uh, make me see my sin uh, when I'd heard so many other sermons before? Uh, Why did that one conference or that uh, one conversation open my eyes to my need of Jesus uh, when I'd heard those truths so many other times? I'm sure that in my own life I'd heard the gospel hundreds of times Uh, before I actually believed it. What is it that makes the difference? Well, if you flick your eyes back to verse 10, uh, it says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God uh, has been given to you. Uh, It's been given to you. It's a gift. You don't earn a gift. You don't deserve a gift. Uh, You simply receive it as a result of the generosity of the giver. And similarly in verse 18, it talks about uh, the one who has, more will be given. You see, if you're a believer this evening, and if the seed of God's word has fallen on fertile soil in your life, uh, then ultimately you have to say that the only reason for that is the sheer grace of God, that he chose to open your eyes. You see, sheer grace is the only reason that the word wasn't snatched away or choked by the pleasures of this world or withered because of lack of moisture. Unearned, unwarranted grace and yet freely given to us through our Lord. And finally we come to the encounter between Jesus and his family. So the crowd is still surrounding Jesus and pressing in on him, and his mother and his brothers come. Uh, But they can't get to Jesus because of the crowd, and so it's told to Jesus, and he gives this somewhat surprising answer. Uh, Verse 21, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And the purpose of this is not primarily to be an affront to Mary or an affront to his family, but instead to starkly make the point that actually Jesus is creating a new people of God. He's creating a new family that will not be based on physical descent, but instead on the authentic hearing and obeying of God's word, that Jesus is bringing forth a harvest. And it's not simply going to be a harvest of physical Israel, uh, but a harvest from all the nations of those who hear God's word uh, and do it. That just like all the way back in the beginning, uh, Jesus is working a new creation by the power and authority of his word. That actually he's going to create a new Israel who having eyes will see 
and having ears will understand. And so the hope held forth in these verses is actually that Jesus is doing a mighty work through his word, that he is creating a new people of God. And 2,000 years on, actually, we can say that the work goes on. Uh, the harvest continues. And I suspect uh, that's why this passage started with that uh, description of those different women, of Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna, uh, as an example of the seed falling on good soil, that even in the midst of these mixed responses to Jesus, uh, the harvest is happening right in front of the disciples' very eyes. And I hope that you can see that actually the harvest is happening in front of your very eyes as well. I don't know you that well as a church, but I wonder if you can see the harvest even here in this very church. If you've been part of this church for some time, uh, then no doubt you've seen the harvest. And uh, no doubt you've seen maybe even uh, people being baptised as little babies up front. Then a few years later, they're off to Sunday school and catechism. And then a few years after that, they are mature believers who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the promised harvest, or part of the promised harvest, brothers and sisters. And now God's call to us is to continue to sow that same gospel word, uh, trusting that actually Jesus is the Lord of the harvest and his word will not return to him empty. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your promised harvest. Uh, we thank you that 2,000 years on and the harvest goes on, we thank you for the harvest in this very church. Father, we know that uh, every single person in this church uh, who, who authentically hears the word of God and does it is an example of your harvest and the work that you're doing. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the Lord of the harvest. And Father, though it can be easy to grow discouraged, you are still the king who is on your throne and you are still building a kingdom which will never pass away. So we thank you for that, Lord. And we pray for each and every one of us here this evening. And we pray that our hearts, by your Spirit, might be fertile soil in which the Word of God grows and brings forth a harvest. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to stand and sing together. We're going to sing number 409, O oh Lord, Alert Your Church, a song all about the harvest. can honestly say, we sang that this morning in Hukanui, and Aberdeen sings it a lot better than Hukanui does, so 
Well done. Um, receive the blessing of the Lord for all who love him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We'll close by singing Psalm 67.